live from Barcelona, Spain, it's theCUBE, covering KubeCon CloudNativeCon Europe 2019. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and ecosystem partners. Hi, and welcome back. This is theCUBE's coverage of KubeCon, Cloud Native Con 2019, here in Barcelona, Spain. We're at the end of day one of two days of live wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Uh, I'm Stu Miniman, and uh, at the end of the day, what we try to do always is do our independent analysis and say what we really think, and joining me is someone that usually has no problem telling you exactly what he thinks online, so I've challenged Mr. Corey Quinn, cloud economist, with the Duckbell Group, and the curator, author, last week in AWS, uh, to tell us what he actually thinks. So, well, uh, Stu, you know what your problem is. All, all the best feedback starts off that way. No, it, this has been a fascinating experience for me. This is the first time I've ever been to KubeCon, yeah. and I didn't quite know what to expect, but Corey, it wasn't. Corey, yeah. it's KubeCon, not KubeCon. Come on, it is in GitHub, how you have to make the pronunciation correct. So Kubernetes. We are on the cube. We would Cube think Con. that we would be subject matter experts the on this. The CNCF will be cracking down on you if I don't correct you on this. So like, I still maintain right. we're in Barcelona, Italy, but that's a whole separate argument to have with other people. Uh, yes, well, most Americans are geographically challenged, and uh, we understand you have some challenges too. Corey. Exactly. When most Americans need to learn geography, we go to war. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Corey, I guess first question for you is: um, you usually go to mostly AWS shows. Most of the customers we've talked to have been AWS customers, so is this feeling much different from the usual show you go to? The focus of the conversations is different, and to be clear, I'm not much of a cloud partisan myself. I deal with AWS primarily because, not for nothing, that's where my customers are. That tends to be exactly where the expensive problems tend to live, for better or worse. If that changes, so will I. Yeah, so, so are you saying yet that the other cloud providers don't have their customers with big enough bills, or they just haven't figured out how you might be able to help them in the to future? To be very honest, with you, yes, is the short answer. Uh, right now in aggregate, my customers spend about a billion dollars a year on AWS. I don't see the same order of magnitude on other providers, but it's coming. It is very clearly coming. None of these providers are shrinking as far as size goes. It's largely a matter of time. All right, but Corey, I hope at least you, you've understood that Kubernetes is the answer for all things, and that multi-cloud is the way that we are today and will always be in the future, and we should all hold hands and sing along that we all get along. Is that, is that, that what you've learned so far? I, I think that's absolutely what I've learned so far, it comes down to religion, and it's perfectly named for it. I mean, Kubernetes was the Greek god of spending money on cloud services. Uh, all right, but seriously, uh, you know, you know, Corey, I think one of the things that, that I really liked is we talked to customers, and there were some interesting things, at least I heard, when you talked about they see huge value in what they're doing with Kubernetes. Many of them only have one cloud provider today, yet they are choosing to layer on Kubernetes either with AWS or with another solution uh, there. What, what, what's been your take of what you've, what you've heard about kind of the, the why and what they're doing? There have been a few different reasons on it. One that resonated with me did validate what I talked about at the beginning of the day, which was that by trying to position yourself to be strategically amenable to any potential provider you might want to use in the future, you are sacrificing velocity and at the, you're gaining agility, losing velocity to do that. Is that trade-off worth it? I don't think I'm qualified to judge. I think that's a decision every business has to make on its own. My argument has always been that if that's a decision you make, do it knowingly. And I don't think we've talked to anyone who's made that unknowingly today. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's a, that's a really good point. Um, what, what else, what, what has you know, surprised you or interest you uh, that we've heard so far? I have to be honest, I have a long and storied history in open source. I was, free, I was staff on the Freenode IRC network for about a decade, uh, which was an interesting time. And I've seen a lot of stuff, but I don't think I've ever seen two open source projects merge before. The fact that we saw that today is still swirling around in my head, for better or worse. Yeah, uh, and, and it was open census and open tracing coming together at open telemetry, so uh, you know, definitely check out Ben Sigelman and uh, it was Morgan uh, McLean from uh, Google Cloud. Uh, you know, really interesting discussion, and even, you know, I don't think we're sharing too much when we say, you know, off camera, they were like, look, it's like, yes, they got us in a room and we worked, but you know, we'll try not to throw punches here on the set and everything like that. We understand that, look, there are people that, you know, Know, put these things together and you know you have smart people that build things the way that it should be done and these were not like two very similar projects going in the same direction they were you know built with you know different 
you know, you know, design principles, and therefore there will be some things that they will need to reconcile uh, to be able to go forward. Uh, but yeah, very interesting. And everyone we spoke to today was very focused on what the needs of their customers, whoever they happen to be, and how to meet those customers and their business requirements. There's no one that we spoke to that was sitting here saying, oh, we, this is the right answer because it is technically correct. The answers were always of the form, this is what we need to do in order to serve customers. And it's very hard to argue against that strategy. All right, uh, but uh, none of this really matters because serverless, right, Corey? Oh, absolutely. Serverless is the way and the light of the future. And to some extent, I believe that. Well, but well on if the they're not doing serverless, I'm pretty sure they're half a step behind you. Yes, yes, it, it tends to be, it's easy to make go ahead and, uh, and say that, oh, if you're not running the absolute latest bleeding edge thing, you're behind, you're backwards, et cetera. And I don't get at all the sense that that is reality. I think that there's, if you're building something greenfield today, you're fundamentally going to make different choices if you, than if you have something you're trying to carry forward. And I don't just mean carrying forward in a technical sense. I mean carrying it forward in terms of process, in terms of culture, in terms of existing business units that need to modernize. People are moving in the same general direction. The question that I think is still unanswered is, today there's a perception, rightly or wrongly, that containers are slightly behind serverless. I don't know that that necessarily holds true. I think that they are aligned toward the same business value. I think to judge either one of them by today's constraints in the context of longer term strategy is a mistake. Well, and I'm know, curious to see what happens. And, and Corey, I, I, I love, so we had Jeff Burr on from Intuit uh, and you know they were like, look, we're doing serverless, we're doing a lot of containerless stuff and I'd love it for my developer not to have to worry about and they've even moved down that path. So you know, uh, we know one of the truisms out there is everything in IT is always additive. Uh, when, when you talk to them and say, oh, well I'm going in the cloud, wait, you know, I still have some stuff that's you know running on my mainframe or my i series, and you know that will probably be running there when I've retired. Uh, you know, we were talking offline. It's like, well, there's been a little resurgence in COBOL uh, just because you know it did not die after Y2K, and so did these things always you know, come back and it's always additive and the longer you, you've been in business as a company, the more legacy you need to be able to maintain and extend and connect to where you want to go with the future. It's almost a sawtooth curve. As complexity continues to rise until it becomes to a point where it's untenable, there's something that comes out that abstracts that away and you're back down to a level a human being might actually be able to understand. Yeah. And you take it a step further and you start to see it again and again and again and then it collapses down. Docker and a lot of the hand-built orchestration systems were like that and then Kubernetes came out and Initially, that was fairly simple, and then things have been added to it now, and I think we're climbing that sawtooth curve again. Whether or not that maintains, whether or not that simplifies again, I, I find that history rhymes, particularly in tech. Well, yeah, and I always worry sometimes when you talk about the abstraction layer, you got to be really careful what you're abstracting. What we see here a lot is, a lot of times it's people, how can I just consume that? I want to buy it as a service and somebody take care of that, not you know, hiding, you know, it, it hides the complexity for me, but some of the complexity is still there. Right, it's, so our site is now intermittently slow. What do you plan to do? It's update my resume immediately because we're never untangling that Gordian knot of an infrastructure. Well, that's not a great answer, but it is an honest one in well, some shops. Look, and, and I, I, I've talked to, you know, the, we, we know that there was, you know, for a long time people outsourced what they were doing. And we need to make sure that when you're buying something as a service that you haven't outsourced, that you understand what's important to your business, what happens when things go wrong. We had some discussions today about you know, networking and observability that we need to be able to go down that rabbit hole, at least turn to somebody who can, because just because I can't touch that gear doesn't mean my neck's not on the line if something goes wrong. You can outsource a lot of work, you can't outsource responsibility. Uh, put slightly more succinctly, the line I've always liked was you own your own availability. If you have a provider that you've thrown a lot of these things over to and they go down, well sure, you're going to have loud angry phone calls and maybe a few bucks back from an SLA credit. We, your customers were down and we're suffering. So the choices you made impact your business's perception in the market and your customer's happiness. So it, as much as fun as it is to be able to throw things over the wall for someone else to deal with, you're still responsible, and I think that people forget that at their own peril. Yeah, uh, Corey, I think one of the things I like, I've got a long history in open source too, is if there are things that aren't perfect or things that are maturing, a lot of times we're talking about them in public because there is a roadmap and you know people are working on it and we can all go to the repositories and you know see where people are complaining. So at a show like this, I, I feel like it, 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 we do have some tr level of transparency and we can actually have realism here. It, it, you know, what, what, what's been your experience so far and, and 
I think that people have been remarkably transparent about the challenges that they're facing in a way that you don't often get at a vendor show. Where you have a single vendor, you're at their show, regardless of who that might be, you're not going to be invited back if you wind up with a litany of people coming on a video show or a podcast or screaming and sobbing in the bathroom, however you want to, whatever your media is, who just have a litany of complaints the entire time or make that provider look bad. Here, there's no, I don't sense that there's any of that pressure. And for some reason, and this is my first KubeCon, so maybe this is just uh, the way this culture works, everyone, regardless of who they worked for or what they're working on or what their experience has been, seems happy. I can only assume there's something in the water. All right, well, I've just been informed that the CNCF had asked me to remove Corey because he refuses to say KubeCon. Uh, but uh, Corey, uh, since this might be your last time uh, on the program, uh, any other final words that you have for it? Or I will let you do something very rare, and if you have any questions for me, lob them my way. Absolutely. Uh, what did you find today that you didn't expect to find? Yeah, um, so you know the, the the one that jumps out for me really uh, is you know two things. One, it, we we discussed it already is the uh, the observability piece coming together. Mm -hmm. um, the other one is. You talk about that maturation of where Amazon fits in this ecosystem, and we had you know a lovely conversation uh, with, with with Abby Fuller. But not just that, when we talk to the users and how they think about it, which is what really matters, is you know there's so much talk about who contributes more code and who does the most here. But look, <laughs> we're talking cloud. Most of these customers are using AWS as, if not the cloud, one of the clouds. I've said it on theCUBE many times, when, when you live in a hybrid and multi-cloud world, in the public cloud, you know, AWS is you know, the far leader. There, there's no debating that. So th they are participating here. They are doing plenty for what their customers want and they give choice and they listen uh, to the feedback. So that was interesting to me, that maturation of where that sits because uh, to, to, to be, you know, when I come into the show, and many times it is, well, it is the open source and this whole ecosystem trying to prevent Amazon from taking over the world. And look, we want a good, robust ecosystem out there. We absolutely uh, while I have do. many friends that work for Amazon, we probably don't want all, to all be working for a single company down the road. Uh, but you know, <laughs> I <laughs> certainly don't. Yeah. So, so we, we, we like a nice, robust ecosystem where there's choice out there, and that keeps it options. So that maturation of where they are um, has been interesting to me so far, especially from the user standpoint. Very much so. I, I don't think that anyone wants to look back and say, wow, I'm sure glad we have only one option in this entire space that does anything useful, and then a whole bunch of could have but didn't. And for better or worse, I don't think that the future is nearly as clear cut as the past of cloud. Historically, AWS has been the 800 pound gorilla. I think that there, we're hearing fascinating things from GCP and from Azure. I don't necessarily think that the, the future is preordained. I do think right now it is AWS's game to lose, but I'm starting to see a lot of other players in the space start to make a lot of very interesting and arguably very correct moves. All right, well, we know you as our audience have lots of places where you can turn to find your information, and we are always pleased that when you turn to us to watch theCUBE, if you have any feedback for ourselves, Corey Quinn and myself, Stu Miniman, uh, reach out on Twitter, uh, we're easy to reach on that, and we have lots of hosts, so if you're like, hey, uh, tired of looking at this mug here, uh, let us know, but hopefully we are asking the questions and digging into the areas that you want and will help your businesses uh, going forward. Uh, so we are at the end of day one, two days live coverage here at KubeCon, Cloud Native Con. This is theCUBE, your leader in live tech coverage. Thanks for watching.